May the 20th, 2017. Donald Trump arrives in Saudi Arabia, his first trip abroad as US president. Trump's aim was to have wealthy Gulf nations join the US bid to defeat ISIL to help end the war in Syria and contain what the US described as Iran's growing influence. But that was a short-lived hope. Four days later, the website of Qatar's news agency was hacked and fabricated statements posted attributed to the Emir of Qatar, critical of US policies in the region. The Washington Post subsequently cited US intelligence officials saying the UAE orchestrated the hacking. That was just the beginning. On June the 5th, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Bahrain and Egypt severed diplomatic ties with Qatar and imposed a land, sea and air blockade which continues until now. The Qatari government strongly denies allegations of supporting extremism. Qatar also condemned a list of demands from the quartet as a breach of sovereignty. The 13 demands included curbing relations with Iran, closing a Turkish military base and shutting down the Al Jazeera media network. There is no appetite at the moment um, in the international community to, to get involved in the Gulf crisis. The COVID-19 pandemic has really consumed pretty much any policy making uh, capacity in Western capitals and other international capitals. Everybody's looking at uh, dealing with that pandemic. Any insecurities across the Middle East uh, and the Gulf crisis is just one of many crises in the Middle East uh, have been uh, put on the back burner. This is the man widely seen by Qatar as the architect of the blockade, Mohammed bin Zayed, the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi and effectively the ruler of the United Arab Emirates. Bin Zayed and Saudi Arabia's Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman both strongly oppose calls for democratic reforms that have gained momentum in the region since the Arab Spring uprisings nine years ago. This region is too small, the countries are too small to live alone. The challenges are huge. Uh, we are talking just not about traditional challenges and threats, but we are talking about non-traditional now uh, challenges and threats, you know, economics, uh, pandemics, uh, social, uh, environmental, and all of these, uh, uh, as well as, of course, the, the hard security. All of these can only be confronted if all the region works together as one unit. Qatar has ruled out withdrawing from the GCC and says it welcomes talks with its rivals, but only when the blockade is lifted. According to the Wall Street Journal, Trump has recently called on Saudi Arabia and the UAE to end their ban on Qatari airlines using their airspace. But this was turned down by the Saudis and Emirates, who believe the restrictions are their only leverage to extract concessions from Qatar. The blockade has left lasting wounds for Qataris. They hope their Gulf rivals will mend the diplomatic rift one day. But Qatar and the Saudi-led quartet remain divided over a wide range of issues that reconciliation may take a long time. Hashim Al-Bara Al Jazeera, Doha. Well, as you heard there, one of the incidents that led up to the blockade was the hacking of Qatar's news agency. Three years on, disinformation networks are still active, spreading rumors that uh, tend to jump from Twitter to newspapers printed in blockading countries. Most are aimed at discrediting Qatar's ruling royal family. In the past few months, for example, Qatar has denied unconfirmed reports it was planning to leave the Gulf Corporation Council. Before that, there were rumors of a coup attempt, all based on a fake video. In April, Saudi-owned Al Arabiya, Sky News Arabia and BBC Arabic all reported that a Qatari dissident had been killed in a Doha prison. All have since deleted their reports. The Qatari government told the AFP news agency that the first disinformation campaign back in 2017 was unprecedented but that people no longer take them seriously. Well, let's speak to Mark Owen Jones about this. He's an assistant professor of Middle East studies at Hamad bin Khalifa University, is now by Skype from here in Doha. Mark, very good to have you with us on Al Jazeera. 
You know, there have been past tensions between these countries. This is not the first crisis to hit the GCC. What sets this particular one apart? And why do you think the disinformation campaign has seemingly been amplified this time around? Uh, I think, I mean, this is unprecedented, as you mentioned in your report. The severity of the blockade and the conditions imposed on Qatar, we've never seen anything like this before. Uh, I think disinformation is, has been crucial to this campaign. For any uh, political move, whether it's war or an, the initiation of a crisis, uh, a country such as Saudi or the Emirates have to try and legitimize that decision and get the public opinion on side. Uh, traditionally, that was done through traditional media, such as newspapers or television. However, because of the rise of digital media and social media, the high technological penetration rates uh, in, in Saudi, the UAE, Egypt, the best way to do that, to convince people that there is something wrong, is to try and fabricate the story through social media uh, and create the illusion that there's a popular groundswell of opinion uh, supporting this uh, decision to isolate Qatar. Right. The, the disinformation campaign seems to have increased... Uh a lot in the past year, judging from you know what we see on Twitter. About a month ago, uh, at the start of the holy month of Ramadan, Twitter was rife with rumors of a coup here in Qatar. Who is behind all this, creating you know the fake messages, the fake accounts online? Yeah, I mean, so the rumors of a coup, uh, I, I prefer to rephrase it as a, a deliberate disinformation campaign, mm. because rumors of a coup implies that a fake video was shared or a fake news was shared and then people picked it up innocently and then spread it. That would be mission as opposed to disinformation. Uh, if we analyze the data um, of this fake trend, this fake story, we see that um, a lot of the people driving it are the verified accounts of Saudi influencers. So these are people we know to be real, they have high follower bases, uh, and they have been consistently the same group of users uh, in both the rumors that uh, began on the 4th of May and that began again 10 years later. Uh, 10 days later, sorry. So what this would suggest to me is that there is an orchestrated campaign to spread these messages mm -hmm. that involves the use of fake accounts, bots, but also a co-opted group of influencers who presumably are, uh, you know, uh, contracted by a uh, maybe a what? marketing company on behalf of someone else to spread the news. Or, Mark, let me just ask you before we go, what, what sort of reach this is having? What sort of impact are we seeing these campaigns having overall? And, and you know, are they effective? Um, I think they are effective, uh, particularly to domestic audiences. The, 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 what we know now is because these disinformation campaigns are so common, there is an, a sort of infrastructure in place of people, myself, who monitor these. So we can quickly identify that these are fake news stories and allow the counter narrative to be put out there, or at least people to fact check these claims and know they are false. However, if you live in, say, Saudi or United Arab Emirates and rely on, say, channels like Al Arabiya or Sky News Arabia or domestic newspapers, there's a very good chance that you believe a lot of these fake stories to be true. And this will um, basically serve the domestic audience in those countries and serve them to make them believe that there is a conflict or a crisis continuing in Qatar. Thank you so much for talking to us about this. Mark Owen-Jones from the Hamad bin Khalifa University here in Doha. Thank you for your time.